expecting you to speak. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Please fold yourself into your table. You've probably heard the phrase, common sense is not very common. That was first recorded by Voltaire 350 years ago. And I would say in the 350 years since he said it, things have not improved much. And yet, we are more educated now as human beings than we ever have been. So how is it possible that we're more educated and yet have less common sense? And it's because there is a massive difference between knowledge and wisdom. There is a massive difference between what we know and learn and how we live our lives. It is knowledge is head knowledge. Wisdom is practice. It is knowing and learning through experience that we actually prove to be wise. It's why when Carrie and I do premarital counseling with couples, we don't spend a lot of time going through the nuts and bolts of how to be married because it's all theory at that point. They need a little practice. So we just talk to them about the big picture things and communication and how to love Christ and what the picture of marriage is. It's why, even though I have two master's degrees already from my past life and education, I'm really glad I waited to get my third master's in divinity until I'm actually doing the job they're teaching me to do. Because it's not theory anymore. Right? It's practice. And it's driving home that wisdom down into my soul. But one of the things we've got to realize as believers in Christ is that the world knows nothing of God's wisdom. The world knows nothing of the wisdom of God. How do we know that? Because Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians, the gospel is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to those who are being saved, it is the power of God. So who among us are fools? Right? Who among us, even in this room, are foolish? Who, don't, who have not yet tasted of the grace of God? But here's something else we need to understand if we've tasted of His grace. If we are His. That Paul in that same passage says that God has chosen the foolish things of this world to shame the wise. So every, when I say who among us are fools, all of us really ought to raise our hands and say praise the Lord that apart from Him, I am a fool. So today we're going to dive into His Word and we're going to look at the question, we're going to look at how do we know wisdom. And that's the title of today's message. We're continuing in James. So open up your Bibles to the book of James and we're going to talk about what it looks like to know Wisdom, And I'm going to pick it up and read the passage we're going to be in today. I'm going to pick it up where we left off last week. So James is after the big book of Hebrews. We're in James chapter 3. But I'm going to pick it up back in verse 6, which is what we taught on last week when we were talking about the tongue. James 3, 6, And the tongue is a fire, the very world of iniquity, and the tongue is set among our members as that which defiles the entire body and sets on fire the course of our life. It is set on fire by hell. For every species of bird and of beast and bird, and reptile and creature of the sea is tamed and has been tamed by the human race. But no one can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil full of deadly poison. With it we bless our Lord the Father and with it we curse men we have been made, who have been made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth come blessing and cursing. My brethren, these things ought not be this way. Does a fountain send out from the same opening fresh and bitter water? Can a fig tree, my, my brethren, produce olives of a vine and, and, or a vine produce figs? How can salt water produce fresh? Now I read that because it, he's, he, we changed, we, there's a little pericope here in my Bible that says wisdom from above, but when he wrote it, this was all one thought to him. So we're going to keep going. So in light of what he just wrote, who among you is wise and understanding? Let him show by his good behavior his deeds in the gentleness of wisdom. But if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your heart, do not be arrogant and so lie against the truth. This wisdom, that is, this wisdom is not that which comes down from above, but is earthly, natural, demonic. For where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there is disorder in every evil thing. But the wisdom from above is first pure then peaceable, gentle, reasonable, full of mercy and good fruits, unwavering and without hypocrisy. And the seed whose fruit is righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. This is the word of the Lord. And Lord, as we continue to worship you in it, I pray that it would go from head knowledge to heart. 
Lord, I pray that it would all that these words that you're speaking would make the tra- would make the trip down deep down into our very souls, that we might look more like Jesus Christ. In His name, we pray. Amen. So the question today is, where are you getting your wisdom? From where are you getting your wisdom? And my, my goal today is twofold. Because I've been saying since we started the series seven weeks ago now that this passage we're in today is the key to the book of James. So my goal is twofold. One, to answer this question that the passage is going to answer for us. Where are we getting our wisdom? And two, it is to prove to you that this, the words we're going to read today, two verses in particular, are the key to why James wrote the book. And it's not all the 15 things he tells us to do. So here's the first thing he's going to show us. First, where you're getting wisdom is more obvious than you might think. First, it's more obvious than where you might think. Look back at verse 13. Who among you is wise and understanding? Let him show by his good behavior his deeds in the gentleness of wisdom. Guys, there is a huge difference, as I said a minute ago, between knowledge and wisdom. Vance Havner pastor who's long since gone to be with the Lord said this, wisdom is not knowledge. If you lack knowledge, go to school. If you lack wisdom, get on your knees. I have that written in my Bible in James because it reminds me that wisdom, it's not about how much you know. Guys, I'll just, if, if, if I could end it right here. The, how, how do we know wisdom? Wisdom is knowing and doing the will of God. Wisdom is knowing and doing the will of God. Wisdom is knowing what to do, it's knowing how to do it, it's knowing why we should do it, and then it's doing it. Those first three things, knowing what to do, knowing how to do it, and even knowing why. I know I'm supposed to do it because I need to be obedient to Christ. I know I'm supposed to do it because it's what God's called me to. Fill in the blank, mean nothing unless we actually do it. That's what James is telling us. In fact, he says, to him who knows, we're going to see this later, to him who knows the right thing to do and does not do it. So to him who knows wisdom and doesn't do it, to him it is sin. That's kind of a big deal. But where do I get this idea of doing wisdom? Because wisdom, because, it, because wisdom is only shown in action, wisdom, wisdom is an action verb. It's not, we, we think of wisdom as as something that we, that we consume up here. But it's, wisdom is actually, it's, it's why James says in the gentleness of wisdom. If wisdom is not an action, how can you do it gently? Right? If all wisdom is is thinking, how can you think gently? He's telling us that it is an action. It's based on what, it's based on, on the idea that, that without the outflow, it really has not, it's all just head knowledge. So on your table talk questions, which are in the back of your connecting points, which you're going to have a chance today, well, part of why we're on in tables is because we're going to talk at our tables today, not for this one though, but we're going to talk, we're going to have a chance in the other two um, table talk questions to talk amongst your tables. The, the first question is, would others say you are wise based on your behavior? Not based on the letters you have after your name or the certificates you have on your wall or what you even say, or your vocabulary, or the brilliant things you post on social media, or, but would they, based on what you do, would they say you are wise? Guys, I say this over and over again. Our two biggest problems, why we don't live wise, know the will of God and do the will of God, is, is there's two, our two big issues. We have the wrong view of God, and we have the wrong view of ourselves. We have the wrong view of God, and we have the wrong view of ourselves, and that pollutes everything else in our lives, including what we do. And so that's really where he's going to go next. But the positive of that is that if we have the right view of ourselves, which is we're sinners in need of saving, and once we're saved, we're saints in need of ongoing grace, and we have the right view of God, that he is all-powerful, all-holy, and, and the only one worthy of worship, and owns every part of me, then we will actually act wise because we'll know that our wisdom is coming from the right source. So when, when I ask the question, where are you getting your wisdom? The first thing is, it's, it's obvious. We are either getting it from the world or we're getting it from him. And that's where James goes next. It is either from enemy territory or it's from our Father above, which will be our last point. So look, we're going to pick it up in verse 14. He says, But if you have bitter, bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your heart, do not be arrogant and so lie against the truth. 
This wisdom is not that which comes down from above, but is earthly, natural, demonic. For where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there is disorder and every evil thing. The first thing he starts with in verse 14, bitter jealousy. That's resentment. That's, he's picking up on, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this because we really hit it hard last week when he was talking about the tongue being set on fire from the very pit of hell. And, we, and he's going to elaborate on that in these verses we have here. But it's, it's basically saying that, that we, have, we have a bitterness or a resentment in our hearts. But guys, sometimes that's really hard for us to discern. Because we hide the pain that we're feeling, and we turn, like, especially we men. Here, men turn almost every feeling we have into anger because we don't want to cry. Because we don't want to, so, so we, turn, we, take this, we take this bitterness that we're feeling or resentment that we're having towards our spouse, maybe it's towards our children, maybe it's towards someone in the church, maybe it's just towards your coworker, and we start to turn it to anger. Because that anger then, one, is being fed by the enemy. And we talked about that last week. But it gives us license then. See, here's the problem. When we start to believe, when we start to tell ourselves that we have the right to feel this way towards that person because of how they've treated us, because of our perception of how they've wronged us, the enemy just, yep, see, you're justified. Yep, you're justified. Yep, you're justified. And it spins out of control. And he's saying, where, where that is existing, where there's jealousy and selfish ambition, where you're promoting yourself and putting yourself over somebody else. And to do that, we almost always do it by putting someone else down. And we always put others down because we're trying to exalt ourselves because it makes us feel better. He's like, that, that is not of God. And he moves on and he talks about arrogance and lying. That's, that we even get to a place where, where we, we have rehearsed the lie that we feel towards other people so much that we believe it's true now. In other words, if, if, you've, if, you've been, if you've been wronged by your spouse, but you keep rehearsing the ways that, rather than just go to them and say, hey, let's talk about this, we start having that conversation in our head, before long, we start to believe it's the truth. And here's the thing, what started out with maybe a piece of truth in it, the longer we let it grow and grow and grow, the enemy just keeps coating it with more and more lies, but we don't see them as lies. All we see them as is that little bit of truth that's maybe started out as, yeah, they probably shouldn't have talked to me that way. Yeah, they probably should have. What? But somehow now it's turned into this massive thing that is almost impossible on our own to overcome. Again, we talked about that a lot last week, so I'm not going to I'm not going to um, I'm not going to belabor it. Thank you. Here's a quote. From a pastor who died, he died in 1889, Henry Van Dyke, not, not Dick Van Dyke, Henry Van Dyke. He said this, and this just ate my lunch, guys. Never, so I want to share it with you. So good luck eating today. Never believe anything bad about anybody else without positively knowing it to be true. Not, I think it's true, not somebody else told me about it, not I'm, I'm assuming it's true. Don't ever, not say, don't ever think anything bad about anyone unless you absolutely know for yourself that it is the truth. And then it says, and then he goes on, and never tell even that. Even if, it's, even if the thing is true and you know it's true, don't even say anything about it unless you're absolutely sure it's, it's absolutely necessary. And here's the part that I ate my lunch. And you know that Christ is hearing every word. <laughs> right? Every gossipy conversation we have, even in our own heads, Christ hears every one of those words. And guys, here's what really just, I mean, it, it Matthew 12. I, I don't remember the verse, the exact verse. Matthew 12. Jesus' words. Every careless word spoken will be accounted for at the day of judgment. I, like, like that just, if, if I didn't fully believe in the grace of God, that would terrify me. Right? Because man, my mouth runs way too much. It just, in, especially between my ears. Verse 15, but it is earthly, natural, demonic. Here's this threefold enemy that we talk about here all the time. The worldly, the earthly is the world. That's one enemy we have. Fleshly, that's of ourselves. That's the, the part of us that's not spiritual. That's the, that's the fleshly part. And demonic of Satan. 
And again, because we talk about that so much, I, I don't want to spend a lot of time on it, but I want you to understand this. Guys, how we view this problem of bitterness, jealousy, all this stuff, through these, it, it's being fed by those three enemies, the world, our flesh, and Satan, and it all flows from how we view this. In the beginning, God. Or John 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word became flesh and made His dwelling among us. Guys, it's... All of our problem can be traced back to how do we view, in, how we finish this, this, that sentence. In the beginning, fill in the blank. In the beginning, creation, the Big Bang, which is what I believe for the first half of my 50 plus years, I, it will cloud how I answer everything else about how I relate to everything else in the world. In the beginning, me, I'm the center of the universe, it will cloud everything I do and everything I say. In the beginning, kingdom. There's two kingdoms, the kingdom of the enemy, Satan, and the kingdom of God. And if I say in the beginning kingdom and my business is my kingdom and raising up my kingdom, my wealth, my prestige, my whatever, it will cloud everything else about every relationship that we are in. Or do we believe in the beginning God? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. That's why we gather here today. Verse 16, Thinking that way, having those problems, he says, in, in that mess is jealousy and selfish ambition and disorder. That means instability. And every evil thing. So in light of that good news, turn the table talk question over and talk. You're going to have just a few minutes in the interest of time to talk at your table about these two things. How have you seen jealousy and selfish ambition show itself in your own heart and in those around you? And then how does knowing that these behaviors are from the world, the flesh, and Satan help you fight them off? Just take a couple minutes. I know you've got to be bold enough to somebody's got to speak up. Quickly go around your table. Sh let people share. Go. And I know we're rushed, um, but I, we have lots of exciting things going on in the second half of the service, so I want to um, just ask, is there um, somebody who would be willing to risk, just from where you're at, just sharing something your table said? Just summarizing a thought about either one of those questions. Go ahead, Scott. Thank you. Well, we just kind of where, uh, you know, I blame that. I look to others, and, you know, those people are doing that, laying blame on others. Mm. And then sometimes we need to look at ourselves the from our eyes. Mm. Good. That's all. I was just thinking that when you started saying, because I mean, I, I heard a little bit of that kind of conversation. Like, we're much quicker to, to notice the sins of others than, than our own. And, and, you, and you quoted the verse, right? That, you know, he's like, you hypocrite. What's with the, you got this log sticking out of your eye. Come on. But we're all pretty good at log pointing out and very bad at, at splinter removal. In your um, bulletin, there was a sheet that you're going to see more of as we move along um, through the spring season. But I wanted to point out one thing. This is something that Brian Tootin and, and Chad Ryan put together, and the leadership team has gone through together. The wives have gone through together. Even the music team has gone through this together. It's called Dealing with Relational Conflict and Restoring Unity. And what I want to, one of the things I want to point out is I, do want, I just wanted to point out that it's in your bulletin. There's excellent stuff here for your marriage, for your family, for relationship in and out of the church. I just wanted to point out right in the middle of the front page where it says where we are. We are brothers and sisters in Christ who not always handle relational conflict well. We're talking about us, Cornerstone Church. The fruit of not handling relational conflict well is disunity and separation. And then this is what Brian and, and Chad kind of outlined us. Here's how the process plays itself out. Number one, I have an issue with someone. So I see a plank, I see a plank sticking out of their eye. I do not want to hurt their feelings and negatively impact, or negatively impact their ministry. So maybe my heart is, you know what, I, don't, I just don't want to create conflict. So I'm going to avoid the conflict. But because of my issue, I no longer want to be near them. Little by little, we start to just pull away. The created distance, that, or that, create, that, that distance then creates emotional and physical distance. Number five, I no longer have a connection with them because I, since I'm not around them, and, and all three of those just make the, con, the, the perceived conflict grow. They don't, they don't bring you in and let you deal with it. They actually, they actually make it seem bigger and bigger and bigger. And then the last one is, um, I choose to end the relationship. Because by, at this point, the, prob, the ball of lie has gotten so big, I don't see any way out of it. And so the easy thing is to just leave. That is exactly how most divorces happen, frankly. 
So take a look at that paper, um, but now, but not now, later, because we're going to move on to our last point. So where are we getting our wisdom? First, it's obvious, it's either from enemy territory or it's flowing down from the Father. And that's our last point. Look at verse, the last two verses that we're going to look at today. Verses 17 and 18. But the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, reasonable, full of mercy and good fruits, unwavering without hypocrisy. And the seed whose fruit is righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. Because we have, we have several citrus trees in our backyard. We have an orange tree and a lemon tree in particular. How do I know what kind of tree they are? By their fruit. But what tells them what to produce? The tree. Right? The, the fruit doesn't look at the tree and say, I want to be, I want to be an orange so make oranges. Right? The fruit on the tree that I have right now is just evidence of what the tree is. And that's true in our own lives as well. We are either getting this chaotic, angry, dissension, bitterness, or we are getting our fruit, this is like his list of the fruits of the Spirit, pure, peaceable, gentle, reasonable, from our Father, through Christ. And where, because he says, where, where is it? Where is it from? The wisdom of God is, is, is the wisdom from above. So it's obviously from the Father. And how we live in that, in that list is evidence of where we're getting our wisdom. Guys, but what I want, part of what I said, I, I want to point out to you a couple things today. And one of them is that this is, this is how, I, how the Lord revealed to me that this, these two verses are the point that this is not a letter. James is not a letter about 15 things that we're supposed to do better. It, there are 15 things listed in James that we're supposed to do better, and we're going through them. In fact, there are seven of them before this passage, and there are seven of them after this passage, and then this passage is the 15th one. But the key is what, what, God, is, what God inspired James to do, like nowhere else in the letter, was right in a way in these two verses that screams out, here is my point. It is not about doing more. It is about who you belong to. It's about your motivation for why. Now, how do I know that? Well, by reading the passage, but not in the English, because in the English we miss it. But in the original Greek, and I don't want to make this a Greek lesson, but it, is, it was so powerful for me to see this, James is inspired by the Holy Spirit to use what's called alliteration. It's starting the words of a sentence with the same letter. That's not true in English. But in Greek, and it'll come up on the board, in Greek, all he, in the midst of this chaos, in the midst of this letter that we've, that we've spent already seven weeks going through, that is just, a, that's just typical speech, all of a sudden, he slows down, and he very intentionally, the only time in the letter, uses this alliteration to point out, it's like, it's like the Holy Spirit is screaming to us today, here is the point. Because every one of those words that he's listing there, the first six, it starts with six epsilons in the Greek. So it's esten epite, which is just, the, it is first. And then it's ierkineke, which is peaceable. And then EP case, which is be considerate or gentle. And then eopithes, which is reasonable. And then muste eleus, which is fully merciful. And then he finishes with these three alphas agathon, which is good, adichristo, which is unwavering or impartial. Anupocristo, which is sincere, genuine, or not hypocritical. Guys, my point isn't to badly pronounce Greek, because I'm horrible at it, and my Greek professor, who will be back here in a few weeks, will tell you that I'm horrible at it. But it's, to, it's not to even have you guys memorize what these words are. It's to, it's, to, it's to invite you into my study and go, guys, we have, is this describing our lives? This is what wisdom looks like. If, if, the, if the whole book of James is a, is a book of wisdom literature about 15 things that we are to do, the question becomes, is, is this describing our very souls? And he stops and he slows down and he says, in an ordered, calm, and peaceful way, so different from the world and from our flesh and from Satan, let me just tell you what this is supposed to look like. 
So, your table talk question says, look again at the list of how godly wisdom shows itself in life. In light of this, would you say that you are a peacemaker? Why or why not? What does peacemaking look like? Pure, peaceable, gentle, reasonable, full of mercy and good fruits, unwavering and without hypocrisy. So take a minute at your tables and talk about that question. Okay, so wrap up your conversation, and I know, you know, and I know this is, and, and we'll hopefully get better at this as we do this more often, which, um, yeah, I don't know how often it'll be yet, but um, it just takes a little bit of figuring out who, how to get into tables that are going to, yeah, allow for conversation, I know, because some of the conversation is awesome, and some of you are looking at each other going, I don't know what to say, but that's okay, um, but I'm going to pick on somebody, Chloe Morris, I know, isn't that horrible? That's so bad. But Chloe loves me, and I love Chloe, and so Chloe Morris. So you guys were talking as I was walking by. I heard you say something about, so the question about what does a peacemaker look like? Do you remember what you said? Okay. Amen. I, out of the mouths of babes. Yeah, I tell you, although she's not really, she's, She's, a, she's graduated from high school, so, you know, she's not really a baby, but, you know. Um, okay. Oh, I'm sorry. So she said, I'm, did you not hear it, actually, Josh, or no? Okay, sorry. Um, she said that, that being a peacemaker as a Christian is not necessarily avoiding conflict, but it's doing, it's, it's entering into conflict in a Christ-like way. Okay, so, as we wrap this up and we get ready to go into our time of response and in song and stuff, I, we're not done yet, so don't close your Bibles, but we're done in James. But guys, I, I, I want to take the time to do something because, because not only is, is this idea of what wisdom looks like and where we get it, it not only is it um, the message of today's message and the message of the book of James, it is the message of the Bible. It is God's message from beginning to end. And to, and to prove that to you, in other words, what, what should our response be to, to what God has done? I want to walk through the gospel story in the book of, in, in Romans. So you turn to Romans chapter 12. Ro, and, it's, and I promise you it's just going to take a couple of minutes. Um, but um, in, in Romans chapter 12, so you're going to be in Romans 12. While you're turning to Romans 12, Romans is between... Um, it's after the big book of Acts, so after the Gospels and Acts, it's before the first and second Corinthians. As you turn to Romans 12, which is one of the great therefores in the Bible, I'm just going to, I'm going to summarize basically what the Gospel story is, because Romans is the Apostle Paul's great thesis on the theology of God and salvation. And so he starts out in Romans chapter 1 saying, I'm not ashamed of the Gospel, because it is the only power of God to save people. And then he says, and the reason we need saving is because the rest of Romans 1 says the wrath of God, because God is perfectly holy and perfectly just, he has to punish rebellion. And we want that in every area of our lives except for with God. We, want a we, would, we would refuse a judge who does not punish rebellion, who does not punish sin. But we want our God to do that. Makes no sense. But then he moves on and he says, so wait a minute, what's the deal? Why is all this wrath going on? It's because in Romans 3, every single person has sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Right? We all, we, in, compared to God's perfection, there is not a person who's ever lived who can enter into that kind of glory. The gap is too wide. So how do we get the gap back? Well, here's the answer. In Romans chapter 5, he talks about when you were still a sinner... When you still didn't even know God. When I was an, a God-mocking atheist as a 24-year-old, Christ died for me. Christ died for you. Why? Why does he have to die? Because Romans chapter 6 tells us the wages of sin is death. We've seen it in James. He talks about that. In the, our desire leads to lust. Our lust leads to death. Right? It, we see it in the garden. They rebel and death enters the world. Things start dying immediately. But then in Romans chapter 8, he gives us the good news and he says, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Praise the Lord. So how do I get into that party? Romans chapter 10. 
If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you are saved. Now he writes this whole thing starting in chapter 1 and he gets to chapter 11 and he's, and, he's, and he's made this amazing argument that I've done no justice to. And he gets to the end of chapter 11 right before I told you to get to chapter 12 and he says, oh, the depths of the wisdom and knowledge of God, how unsearchable his judgments and unfathomable his ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord? In other words, he's going, this, he's, he's writing it by the Spirit and he's going, this is blowing my mind. Because you know what? I would not do it this way. There are people in this room right now going, okay, Doug, I hear what you're preaching, but that makes, that makes no sense to me, either because, either because the Holy Spirit's not helping reveal it to you, or because I just don't want my God to be that way. Well, he deals with that. I skipped that. It's Romans chapter 9. But in, in this context, even Paul is going, this may not be exactly how I would have laid this plan out, God. I wouldn't let sin enter the world. I wouldn't have this. I wouldn't that. I would only punish the really bad people. Okay, where's that line? Where's that line? Who's in and who's out? So he's like, man, how unsearchable his judgments, unfathomable his ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord? He's like, who can figure out what God's thinking? And who's ever been his counselor? Who's going to tell God what to do? And then he ends it with this. But from him, here's the truth. He's like, here's the truth about the gospel. From him and through him and to him are all things. To him be the glory forever and ever. For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be the glory forever, ever and ever. Now we get to the part that I asked you to turn to. And we look at Romans 12 and he says, Therefore, therefore is there for the reason that he's saying, Therefore, in light of everything that was just shared, here's what your role is. Present your body a living and holy sacrifice acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you might prove what is the will of God, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. And you go, okay, that sounds great. How do I do that? Glad you asked. He goes through the spiritual gifts and then he picks it up in verse 9 and this is the key in how it connects to even James and the rest of the gospel story. Because of God's great love for us in the gospel, live this way. Do you got this? And here it goes. Let love be without hypocrisy. Abhor what is evil. Cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in brotherly love. Give preference to one another in honor. Not lagging behind in diligent, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord, rejoicing in hope, persevering in tribulation, devoted in prayer. Guys, does it not sound like James could be writing this? They, he didn't. This was written years after James was dead. He goes on. Contributing to the needs of the saints. Practicing hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Be of the same mind toward one another. Do not be haughty in mind, but associate with the lowly. Do not be wise in your own estimation. Never pay back evil for evil to anyone. Respect what is right in the sight of all. If possible, so far as it depends on you, be at peace with all men. Why is that so hard? And here's why. It's because we all walk out of here and we try to do it in our own strength. Guys, this is this. James, the Bible, the whole story of God is not a list of moral do's and don'ts. Do not disintegrate your Christianity to live morally and do nice things for people. That is not Christianity. Christianity is because God loved me so much he sent his son to do what only his son could do and die for me on a cross when I was rejecting him, he yanked me out of the filth I was in and he put me on the rock that is his son. It is because of that kind of love that I am compelled to love others. That's the answer. But do you see why it's so hard? Because we're not Jesus. Yeah, I have his spirit in me, but I still have this mess. It'd be like this. What if I show, so I'm going to put up a picture of Michelangelo's Sistine Chapel. On the, on the, he, this, is, this is God bringing Adam to life on the top of the Sistine Chapel. I put that up on the screen, and here's your homework assignment, people. And we're wrapping it up with this, I promise. Here's your homework assignment. I want you guys to paint that and bring me back a copy next Sunday. We wouldn't fare well unless the spirit of Michelangelo could somehow indwell my body. I could probably paint that then. Do you see? Do you see the point? The spirit of the living God has indwelled your body. 
Hallelujah. We don't get, we're not trying to paint the Sistine Chapel. We're not trying to do these things that James and Paul are telling us to do in our own strength. If we do, we'll fail. It's because the spirit of the living God has indwelt you. That you are walking with the one who is these things. You are walking with the one who is these things. If you know Christ. Let's pray. Father, I just thank you, Lord. I thank you, Lord, for that truth. I thank you for the truth of the glory of the gospel of Jesus Christ. I thank you that it is not a list of do's and don'ts. I thank you that it is not just trying to do better. Lord, I, 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 know, I, know, I'm, I know my brothers and sisters were guilty of just trying to walk out of here and, 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 and you know, maybe a little bit of conviction and, and yeah, I need to, I need to get back. Don't, just, don't, just stop us from doing that, Lord. Let us instead just look upon the beauty that is the one that is those things. And as we, and as we gaze into you, May that knowledge go down into our hearts and may our hearts then look like his heart because if my heart looks like his heart, then I'll do those things because that's who he is. So Lord, help the people in this room as we continue to worship you in song and in, and in stories of changed lives and in, and, Lord, and in fellowship even. Lord, I want to pray that we would just be a people that would, ex that would experience your presence. That the Spirit of the living God indwells us when we come to faith in Christ. Lord, breathe upon us in Jesus' name. Amen.